from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. At the legislature today, there was a variety show in the House Finance Committee as the Department of Education and the Arts showcased its agencies and programs. And in the Capitol Rotunda, a showcase of scientific research projects that are taking place at the state's colleges and universities. And we continue our discussion about innovative technologies in West Virginia and its impact on the legislature today. Good evening, I'm Beth Voorhees. More than half of this year's $4 billion state budget will be spent on education, and there's much controversy about how and where that money is spent. As Bob Brunner reports, the controversy came to the surface of the Capitol this morning. The Senate Finance Committee listened as State School Superintendent Jeria Marple outlined the goals and priorities educators had determined for the coming year. Among them, pay raises for teachers, innovation in technology, and increased funding for regional education agencies. Then the senators began reacting, one after another. They criticized the priorities, calling instead for practical solutions. Committee Chairman Senator Roman Prezioso says simply, the priorities are wrong and ought to be focused on the students. We got a terrific drug problem. You know, these technology problems that they're looking for, these students have more technology in their back pocket than we ever thought about having. Let's adjust our curriculum to, to teacher mentoring programs to meet the needs of the kids out there that, are, that have these technologies and, and address it accordingly. I don't see that in these priorities. Marple says the priorities are the result of talking with everyone in the education community. We were very methodical about talking with teachers and principals, every superintendent. 53 of the 55 counties took these legislative priorities to their board and said, yes, these are most important. So maybe I need to work on being more articulate about why is it that teacher salaries are important to achievement in our classrooms. Example, last week I talked to a student who'd had five substitutes in the math class so, so far this year. That impacts achievement. Still, senators like Doug Facemeyer, who owns and operates several grocery stores, says high school graduates with diplomas can't add or read. They have a fundamental problem being able to count change back. You send one of them to the milk case to get a quart or a half a gallon of milk or something. That, that, they don't even know what that is. The basic fundamentals that we need to educate and to grow and to learn our children aren't getting. Fundamental math, reading, all this high tech stuff is good and we all understand that. And if you've got the basic fundamentals of education, the three R's so to speak, you can learn to do all this very well. Then former finance chairman Senator Walt Helmick began persistently questioning department officials about funds the legislature has sent to county school systems for several years so county superintendents could deal with the mounting debt called OPEB or other public employee benefits. Now that the legislature is addressing that problem at the state level, Helmick says where did that money go? Where's this money at? How many dollars is available? What are we going to do with it? Is it appropriate for a certain person? Now, obviously, uh, there was a lot of confusion about, you know, what's going to happen with it or how much is there or whatever. And that's what I was trying to do is clear it up, say, you know, where is this money? Who's going to get it? You know, does it come back to us? Do we reappropriate it? Uh, you know, what's going to happen with this money? What's your suspicion? Well, I, I'm sure that there was, there was some... Uh, request in the presentation from the state superintendent of school, one of them was for uh, uh, salary increases. And I would assume that that money is probably going to be earmarked for salary increases. Is it going to go through? Uh, that's, a long, that's a long shot. Superintendent Marple says with thousands of older teachers retiring and state salaries among the worst in the nation, a significant teacher pay raise is vital almost 10,000 teachers can walk out of the door over the next five years. And if we don't have salaries that attract teachers and attract our best and brightest students to go into the profession, then I think as superintendent, I have a duty to say to the legislature and to say to Senate Finance, this is an issue that will impact achievement. 
Clearly there is much debate ahead on the issue of education. The sense of a number of senators is that they want the basics. The sense of the Department of Education seems to be high tech and the future. The governor's budget provides no significant funding increase for the state education department. However, the agency receives 43% of its funding from the federal government. For West Virginia Public Broadcasting, I'm Bob Brunner in Charleston. With Governor Earl Ray Tomlin in Houston today to try to draw a cracker plant to West Virginia, House Minority Leader Tim Armstead made an appeal to lawmakers to make changes to West Virginia's tax structure so they wouldn't have to dance around rules and regulations. Now, I'm, I was very pleased that we did the bill that we did a few days ago that, that the governor, I understand, is now taking with him to try to get attract a cracker plant to our state. And I certainly hope and I think we all believe that it is incredibly important that the governor and, and this administration is successful in attracting a cracker facility, or hopefully more than one, to West Virginia. But I think there are things that we can do so that it makes it unnecessary for us to have to necessarily do a bill like we had to do. As he has for years now, Armstead urged legislators to consider revising the tax structure, specifically the business franchise tax and the inventory and equipment tax. The House Committee on Finance saw a varied presentation from the Department of Education and the Arts. As Adam Cavalier reports, instead of reciting numbers as in a typical budget hearing, the department showed off what it does. The House Finance Committee was a real song and dance number. I leave home a week from now, the second to depart. My father's solemn nod just breaks my mother's heart. To the union my brother marched, turning on his home. He left without his boots, so I took them as my own. That's Brooke High School junior Brent Kimball singing a song he and his classmates composed and performed. Education and Arts Secretary Kay Goodwin says Kimball is one of many examples of the programs the department oversees. The common mission of each division of our department is to collaborate to ensure fruitful and promising opportunities for your constituents. Aside from the daily tasks of the divisions, each boasts a unique and beneficial program or many. Those divisions range from the Division of Culture and History to the Library Commission. One of the programs the department promoted is Imagination Library, which is designed to provide free age-appropriate books monthly to all eligible children. The ambassador for that program is former prisoner of war Jessica Lynch. It is my honor and privilege to introduce West Virginia's ambassador, for the Imagination Library, former prisoner of war, Jessica Lynch. Lynch says the program is one she used with her daughter. Not only did my daughter love reading the books she received each month from Imagination Library, she was thrilled when they arrived. She knew how to recognize her name and then would anxious, anxiously wait for the mail for her package to arrive. She received her last book just two weeks ago before her fifth birthday. And while she is no longer qualifies for this program, I am confident her love of reading will not end. The program is available in 38 of West Virginia's 55 counties. While Lynch says she's thrilled to be involved with the Imagination Library, finance committee members say it's wonderful to have her as an ambassador. The fact that she is a, a, as a young mother and a single mom and is doing this because she believes in West Virginia and in that program of literacy. So that makes, it is, it's a wonderful opportunity, I think, for West Virginia to embrace her as well as embrace this program. And I understood them to say volunteering 
And so I wanted to explore that a little bit more, I thought. Is it going to be a total volunteer or, you know, what that's going to be? So I want to know. And I was hoping that maybe she, we were going to have a time to question her as, and if, uh, or maybe um, Secretary Goodwin would answer the question as to why it's not in 55 counties yet. But I'm interested in finding out. I know firsthand all the benefits and attributes of this program and I think it's wonderful. The West Virginia Department of Education and the Arts, with the support of Governor Tomlin and the West Virginia Legislator, is making a true difference to our future in West Virginia, producing a generation of children who love to read. She took her life and moved it forward in such a positive way, and she's helping our state, she's helping the children, and the fact that she used the service and her daughter was looking for those books and reading to children and teaching them how to read and how to listen and learn, it's all involved. I think it's wonderful that Jessica's doing this. Miller was a member of the board for West Virginia's Commission on the Arts. She says she truly appreciates what services the arts provide. He has a beautiful voice, and I told him, keep it up. He's a junior, and he has beautiful vibrato, and he, singing to uh, canned music is not easy. The night before the battle, prayers run through the camp. Their barrels shiny, clean, and oiled, the air so cold and damp. Empty guns like hollow hearts, filled with powder's hate. What would mother think of me, his life I were to take? They aren't accompanying you, and so he wasn't really able to even do what you can tell his potential, where he can just sing. I, and here he was on crutches, but he, wow, wonderful. Philip says it's the breadth of the program that's so impressive. They just do so much, and, and they cover such a wide variety of programs. That's what just kind of amazes me that they do everything almost and, and of course the cultural center is, is a star in their cap as well so it's just I can't say anything bad about them other than the fact the room was cold this morning. <laughs> the Department of Education and the Arts is scheduled to receive 34.1 million dollars of the 4.1 billion in recommended appropriations for the state's fiscal year 2013 budget. For West Virginia Public Broadcasting I'm Adam Cavalier in Charleston. In a moment, more about scientific research in the state and how it's contributing to economic development. First, here's a look at some of the bills introduced in the Senate today. Among the bills introduced in the Senate today, Senate Bill 431, to lengthen the period for voter registration through the end of early voting. The bill permits registration during early voting to occur only at the county courthouse and permits persons to register and vote on the same day during the early voting period. The bill also prohibits persons from changing party affiliations during the early voting period. Senate Bill 435, to ensure that the funds remaining in a nursing home resident's personal account after their death goes to paying for a decent burial rather than reverting to the state as unclaimed property. Senate Bill 436, to facilitate and encourage collaboration between the public school system and public higher education to promote programs of study and seamless curricula. To establish the West Virginia EDGE initiative, EDGE stands for Earn a Degree, and to require the Board of Education to offer adult basic education programs on community and technical college campuses. Among the bills up for passage in the Senate tomorrow, Senate Bill 221, to require routine suicide prevention training for all teachers and principals. And Senate Bill 224, to change the name of the Division of Banking to the Division of Financial Institutions. Among the bills on second reading, the amendment stage in the Senate tomorrow, Senate Bill 108, to require magistrates to possess a bachelor's degree and associate's degree in criminal justice or have at least four years prior experience as a magistrate, effective January 1, 2015. Senate Bill 202, to permit the Division of Forestry to enter into stewardship contracts and agreements with the U.S. Forest Service. Senate Bill 161, to expand the list of those who required to report abuse and neglect of children to include youth camp administrator or counselor, employee, coach, or volunteer of an entity that provides organized activities for children. The bill requires all persons to report sexual abuse of children to law enforcement within 48 hours of their knowledge of the abuse. 
and Senate Bill 165 to provide that any employee of the Division of Corrections, the Division of Juvenile Services, and the Regional Jail and Correctional Facility Authority who engages in sexual activity with an inmate regardless of consent is guilty of a felony. Each year during the session, eager college and university students come to the state capitol to show off their research projects. Today was the ninth annual Undergraduate Research Day. Up to 100 students stand ready to explain their research to members of the legislature and others in the rotunda. The event demonstrates the importance of higher education funding and provides lawmakers with a chance to hear from the students themselves about their work. Joy Cox from West Virginia University studied the relationship dynamics between members of the military and their spouses to measure for satisfaction and the couple's resilience before, during, and after deployment. What we actually found out is that military couples start high in satisfaction and resilience and agreement. Um, they actually don't get as high once they return. And we also found that satisfaction and resilience drop drastically during deployment. So most couples start out excited, they're ready, they're, they're willing to stand beside each other. And then once uh, they return, we're finding out they're still willing, but not as willing as they were in the beginning. Diana Black, a biology major at WVU, looked at alternative energy for Appalachia by using sorghum as a source for biofuel. Sorghum is used to make molasses, um, especially in Africa and India, they use it as a grain crop. Here it's more prevalent as an animal feedstock, and we're trying to use it as a way to reclaim mine sites, to plant the sorghum there, and especially if it can reduce some of the contamination, that would be great. We can use it as a biofuel or an animal feed, and it'll clean it up. At Marshall University, computer science major Tim Hall researched a solution to an age-old problem finding a space in a crowded parking lot, particularly on a college campus. The name of our research is spot detection. You know, it stands for spot detection. And the whole point of our research is to make a cost-effective, affordable, efficient system for detecting parking spots and reporting it to the user. So that way you don't have people parking in handicapped spaces whenever they get tired of looking for a spot. Um, so they don't park illegally, taking up handicapped spots when, you know, handicapped people may need those spots and basically trying to, to help some people out in, in efficiency of their every, everyday life. These were just three of the fascinating research projects undertaken by undergraduate students from campuses across the state. Officials with the West Virginia Higher Education Community say this event works to ensure that those in state government who provide funding for higher education have a clear understanding of the nature and importance of the programs they fund. And today, the West Virginia Higher Education Policy Commission recognized faculty members at institutions across West Virginia who were awarded more than $300,000 in scientific research grants over the past year. At the ceremony today, our guest said these awards and the opportunities they provide an innovative climate at our institutions. Dr. Paul Hill says this is the best way to grow research competitiveness and create new opportunities across the state. And the interim chancellor joins us tonight. Dr. Hill, welcome. Glad you're here. Thank you, Beth. Pleasure. $300,000 doesn't sound like a lot, but is it? Uh, it? It is in light of the fact that historically we have not provided this type of funding to our institutions and faculty to encourage them. It, you have to look at this, of course, as seed money. It's, it's a small amount to get them started in many cases and to uh, hopefully see them excel in their area to build a case for additional funding. So these are a lot of uh, professors getting small grants that add up to the $300,000. Small grants for, say what, in an example? Um, various things, as you saw the students doing. Everything from working on new biofuels, new types of energy, to uh, research on cancer and leukemia. It's across the board in all the science areas. We've been talking this week about innovative technologies and manufacturing in West Virginia, and it all really begins at the university level. Are you satisfied with how West Virginia is progressing in this area? Well, I'm satisfied with how we are progressing. Uh, I'm not satisfied with where we're at today. Okay. We, we want to go further, obviously, and build an even stronger system for this type of work here in the state. Um, a decade ago, we didn't have these types of funds. We didn't have this type of activity going on. 
It's about the opportunities to really diversify the economy in the state of West Virginia by uh, looking into these areas where new knowledge can be created, where new types of ideas can find their way to the marketplace. That will in turn create new businesses and create new jobs for those students. So it's, a, it's very much a circular opportunity to engage the students as well as the faculty. And that is happening. Here. That is happening, yes. I, I'm delighted. Uh, yesterday we saw Bio West Virginia here looking just at the biotech industry in the state. Mm -hmm. And there were people there who said, you know, five years ago, we would never have had this group of people because this is an emerging set of industries in the state. And, uh, and by that token, I am very much delighted. There's competition between universities, competitions between other states yes. for projects, for money. Are you concerned? Should we be concerned about all this competition coming? We should be. Uh, we look at what we're investing here in West Virginia, and we're very proud of things like the Research Trust Fund and the Challenge Fund that provides annual support to faculty. But you look just across the Ohio River at Ohio, they have something, uh, they have a program that's more than a billion dollars that they have put forth for these very same types of things. Now, on the other hand, Research is fairly unique, so what they are studying might not be the same types of things that we are studying. So we have opportunities even to carve out a niche for ourselves here in West Virginia based on our unique talents and resources. A couple of years ago, when then-Governor Joe Manchin suggested that the state take over the operation of the former Dow Chemical Tech Park in South Charleston, yes. a lot of concern. A lot of hand wringing. A lot of concern. Was this really a good idea? You were probably on the forefront of all of that. How's it going up there? What's happening? I, I was, and I probably lost a little sleep over that, uh, <laughs> but I thought it was a good idea. I thought it was positive, and I believe that today. It's going very well. In fact, um, we, we took over uh, just a little over a year ago the uh, managing those facilities. We have Building 740 had 40% occupancy at that time. It is now approaching 90% occupancy of that same laboratory building. So we've had, we've been able to recruit companies and individuals who are looking for laboratory space, uh, and we have even more interest in the additional buildings that is surfacing. So you see it working as promised? I see it working as promised. It's still going to be a long-term effort, but I do see it uh, as the buildings are renovated and come online, I think we will have customers out there who are looking for that space. Earlier in our program, we reported on the Senate Finance Committee meeting today. Mm -hmm. uh, and regarding the concern, the three R's versus high tech. Mm -hmm. Where do you stand on that as the university chancellor? Where do you stand on this? Absolutely. I see the three R's being the foundation for an education. Mm -hmm. You know, I came through the system uh, at a time where understanding the basics was, was absolutely important. I, I couldn't have become, uh, received degrees in chemistry and biology had I not had a basic understanding of those. I think then you build the technology on top of that. When people are fully capable of utilizing those types of tools and being able to build new tools in that line, that's where the real beauty of, of educating using the basics uh, in addition to uh, technology to take you to the next level. As we move forward in innovative manufacturing and technology, is the work, will the workforce be there for it? I believe it will because that is really what the university system can be most proud of is, is, is turning out workers for the types of jobs in the future. I just came from a meeting today where we're looking at one of our goals is to increase the number of STEM degrees, science, technology, yes. engineering, and mathematics. Mm -hmm. we, we set a goal to increase 5% per year over the past five years. We've actually exceeded that goal. So students are hearing that there will be opportunities out there and we are producing students that will be ready for that workforce. Dr. Paul Hill, Interim Chancellor of the Higher Education Policy Commission, thank you so much. Thank you, Beth. And here's a look at some of the bills introduced in the House today. Among the bills introduced in the House today, House Bill 4301, to require that one copy of medical records be provided to a patient or representative upon written request free of charge. House Bill 4308, a bill at the request of the Supreme Court of Appeals to include Supreme Court justices and retired justices among those individuals authorized to carry a concealed weapon without a permit. 
House Bill 4309, also at the Supreme Court's request, to provide that a child who is physically healthy and presumed safe is a neglected child if he or she is habitually absent from school without good cause. House Bill 4310, to prohibit sex offenders from living or working within 1,000 feet of the outer perimeter of a school, child care facility, playground, or the home of a victim. House Bill 4311, to add $20 million to the West Virginia Trust Fund's Bucks for Brains initiative. And House Bill 4320, to authorize the Secretary of the Department of Environmental Protection to propose legislative rules to settle violations of the Hazardous Waste Management Act by consent agreements as an alternative to instituting a civil action in the circuit courts of the state. Up for passage in the House tomorrow, House Bill 4238 allows people who are participants in the Secretary of State's Address Confidentiality Program to vote an absentee ballot. The Address Confidentiality Program conceals the address of someone who has filed a domestic violence restraining order. On second reading, House Bill 4107, to authorize the State Fire Commission to establish the training requirements for volunteer firefighters by legislative rule. This has been the Legislature Today. Tomorrow, we'll get a short lesson in the state budget. Our guests will be Mark Muco, the Deputy Secretary of Revenue, and Mike McCowan, the Director of the State Budget Office. They'll explain what revenue comes in and how it's spent. I'm Beth Voorhees. Thanks for joining us. Good night. <music>